Matrices and vectors play a very important role in the field of signal processing. We're going to begin to look at that in this particular lecture by interpreting the discrete Fourier transform as a matrix. So taking the transform involves multiplying this matrix times a vector of time series values to get a vector of frequency domain values. So the DFT maps capital N numbers, the values of the time domain signal x0, x1 through x n minus 1 into n new numbers, the values of the frequency domain signal or representation x0 capital X1 through capital Xn minus 1. So we're taking n numbers, mapping them into n new numbers, and this is easily represented in terms of matrix operation applied to an n by n 1 vector. We take an n by n DFT matrix, multiply it times an n by 1 vector of the time signal values, turns out we'll get the n frequency domain coefficients. This is a very useful way to view the DFT and shows, begins to show the power of matrix or linear algebra in the field of signal processing. So we're going to start with capital N equals 4 as an example, and I've just written out the expression for the DFT here when N is equal to 4. Expanding out the sum, we can see that this becomes X sub 0 times W sub 4 raised to the K times 0 power, where here we're defining W sub N to be the complex exponential e to the minus j 2 pi over n plus x of 1 times w sub 4 times raised to the k times 1 power plus x2 times w4 raised to the 2k power plus x3 times w4 raised to the 3k power. Now this expression written out like this looks like the inner product of a row vector involving the w's and a column vector involving the x's. And that's how we're going to write it. I'm going to do this for different values of k. So starting with k equals 0, in that case, the power in all of these w4s, all of them are raised to the 0th power, because each of them is k times some integer. Capital X of 0 is equal to x0 times w40 plus x1 times w4 to the 0 plus w40 times x2 plus w40 to x3. And then we'll do the k equals 1 case. So now k is 1. Capital X of 1 is w4 raised to the 0 times x0 plus w4 raised to the 1 times x1 plus w4 squared times x2 plus w4 cubed times x of 3. And similarly, we can continue this process for k equals 2 and get this inner product of this row with this column to give us capital X of 2, as well as doing this for k equals 3, where we have the inner product of this last row times the column vector consisting of the time series data x. And you see that we've written the DFT coefficients over here on the left as a matrix times the time domain signal values contained in this vector here on the right. So in general, if we define vectors x underscore, and this is a lowercase x, and as a vector, we're representing it by vectors by the underscore, and there's capital N elements in this vector. It's a column vector, so x of 0, x of 1, through x of n minus 1. And we're going to use column vectors in general. If we want a row vector, we'll write that out as a transpose. And we'll define another vector, capital X, with an underscore, that has the capital N values of the DFT coefficients. So if I use this notation, then I can write the DFT coefficients, capital X, in the vector as a product of a matrix W times the vector of time samples, lowercase x. And in this case, if you go look at the DFT, and I've written out that expression in the bottom here for arbitrary n, as opposed to n equals 4 on the previous slide, and you have this inner product of a bunch of Ws with the corresponding time domain signal values, and we can assemble then the W's into this matrix capital W, and the elements are all listed here. So our DFT coefficients are the product of this matrix W 
times a vector of time samples. Well, if the DFT implies that capital X is equal to W, this matrix, times the time series values, lower X, we know that there's an inverse DFT which expresses X, the time values, lowercase x, in terms of the frequency domain values, capital X. And from linear algebra, or matrix algebra, we would just simply invert W, assuming W is invertible, and write that the time values, lowercase x, are equal to W inverse times the uppercase value of x, which is the frequency domain coefficients. And this has to be the inverse DFT. And indeed, we can find the matrix W inverse, simply enough, if I look at the expression for the inverse DFT, remember it's x of n is this 1 over n times the sum from k equals 0 to cap n minus 1, x of k times e to the jk 2 pi over cap n times lowercase n, which I can explicitly write out the sum using my w sub n notation again to simplify things as this form here. And once again, this looks like the inner product between the DFT coefficients, the x's, and another vector made up of these w's with the 1 over n out front. I can write these in matrix vector form by putting all the DFT coefficients into my vector capital X, and I'll have my vector lowercase x consisting of time samples on the left-hand side, and this equation that we've written out here for the inverse DFT can be then converted to matrix form, just as we did a moment ago, and we get a matrix of w's raised to negative integer powers and a 1 over n out front. So this must be capital W inverse. And indeed, you can check that if you multiply the matrix W times the matrix W inverse or W inverse times the matrix W, you end up with the identity matrix. And one of the interesting things about this particular matrix, the DFT matrix, is that it has a fairly special property. If you look at what we call W inverse here, well, there's the 1 over N out front, and then all the entries in here, before we had W sub N to positive integer powers, now they're negative integer powers, and we can write that just by expressing it in terms of W, as the complex conjugate transpose. And that's what this superscript H here means. It means we're taking the complex conjugate of all the elements in W and then transposing that matrix. So the inverse of W is actually the complex conjugate transpose of W normalized by N. And that's a fairly special property. Now this leads us to the linear algebraic notion of basis vectors. And we'll define a vector lowercase w sub l to be the lth column of w inverse. So I'm sort of using a MATLAB notation here with the colon, meaning we collect all the rows, but only the lth column. And in that case, I can express the product of this inverse matrix times the DFT coefficient vector by expanding out the columns of w inverse and the individual DFT coefficient values to write this as W sub 1, the first column of W inverse, times x0, plus the second column times x1, plus the third column times x2, and so on, plus the nth column times xn. And our vector of time domain values is a sum of other vectors, these Ws, that are weighted appropriately by the DFT coefficients. So these W sub 1, 2, and so on, the columns of W inverse, are basis vectors for representing X. We're describing X as a weighted sum of other vectors, and those vectors then can be thought of as basis vectors. When we look at these basis vectors, we see that they are just complex sinusoids, and their frequency is L times 2 pi. You need to have a 1 over N out front because this is the inverse matrix. But anyway, these are vectors that can be thought of as building blocks for the time domain signal capital X. Now it turns out that you can also 
come up with matrix vector versions of all the properties of the DFT. And I've just shown one here, the Parseval property, which says that 1 over n times the sum from k equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of the magnitude squared of all the DFT coefficients. Remember, that's supposed to be equal to the sum of the magnitude squared of all the time domain values. Well, I can write this sum of the magnitude squared as the inner product of the DFT vector, capital X, complex conjugate transpose, with the DFT vector, X. This just forms the sum of the magnitude squared. And now, if I substitute for the DFT vector, capital X, the expression in the DFT, that capital X is matrix W times lowercase x, the time signals, then I see that I have this expanded out as 1 over n, lowercase x, complex conjugate transpose, times w, complex conjugate transpose, times w, times x. And we saw on the previous page, when we looked at the inverse DFT, that wh times w is equal to n times the identity, because wh is equal to n times the inverse of w. And therefore, these cancel out, and this n will cancel this n, and we're left with the inner product of x, complex conjugate transpose with itself, and that's just the sum of the squares of the xn. So it's a very convenient way to prove Parseval's theorem using these matrix vector properties, and it's a pretty powerful viewpoint and that applies to many of the other DFT properties as well.